Hello everyone, welcome to the second part of our lecture. We will be discussing your exchange rate uh, forecasting. So uh, companies need to predict future exchange rate uh, variations raises the issue of whether it is worthwhile for a company to invest in exchange rate uh, forecasting services to aid decision making. So basically, there are two schools of thought that would address this issue. So first, we have the efficient uh, market school. So efficient market school argues that forward exchange rates do not or do the best possible job of forecasting uh, future spot exchange rates and therefore investing in forecasting services would actually be a waste of money. So forward exchange rates represent uh, market participants collective predictions of likely spot exchange rates at specified uh, future dates. So if forward exchange rates are the best possible predictor of future spot rates, it would uh, make no sense for companies to spend additional money to forecast short-run exchange rate movements. So forward exchange rate reflects all available information and an efficient market is one in which prices reflect all available public information. Okay, so the other uh, school of thought is, of course, the inefficient a market school. So, inefficient market school argues that companies can improve the foreign exchange market's estimate of future exchange rates, okay, as, continue, uh, as contained in the forward uh, rate by investing in forecasting services. So, in other words, uh, this school of thought does not believe that forward exchange rates are the best possible predictors of future spot uh, exchange rates. So, an efficient market is one in which uh, prices do not reflect all available information. So, in an efficient market, forward exchange rates will not be the best possible predictors of future spot exchange rates. So, if this is true, it may be worthwhile for international uh, businesses to invest. Okay, now let's discuss the different approaches to forecasting. So first, we have here, okay, fundamental analysis. So your fundamental analysis draws uh, on economic theory to construct sophisticated econometric uh, models for predicting exchange rate movements. Uh, the variables contained basically in these models typically include those uh, that we have discussed before, such as what are these? Uh, relative money supply growth rates, inflation rates, what else? Interest rates, okay? So, in addition, they may also include variables related to balance of payments position. So, uh, guessing the market reaction to news basically this is guessing the market reaction to news so if there is deficit in bop or your balance of uh, payment there would be depreciation of currency so if there is an increase in the supply of money there would still be depreciation also of currency okay Okay, so basically in this illustration, if the interest is high, the value of the currency will increase because a lot of foreign investors will buy the currency. Therefore, there would be high demand. So inflation rate, okay, um, by the way, when we speak of inflation, it is the rise in the general level of prices where a unit of currency effectively buys less than it did in the prior periods. So if inflation rate drives economic growth, 
Okay, let's say maybe 2 to 3% inflation rate, okay, is healthy to the economy. However, in hyperinflation is not healthy. Okay, inflation of zero is also unhealthy. Why? Because people would delay buying transaction. So your CPI or your consumer price index, okay, a uh, monthly indicator of price commodities in an economy which directly reflects uh, the inflation of a country. Usually, if CPI goes up, your consumer price index, index rather, so if it goes up, interest rates will actually follow so insert now your employment rate so if there are more jobs okay it would equate to more money there would be higher liquidity okay however it would also increase uh, interest rate okay that would increase the value of currency there would be higher value of currency okay so there you go Okay, so next, another approach to forecasting is your technical analysis. So basically, when we speak of your technical analysis, it uses okay, price and volume data to determine past trends, which are expected to con continue in the future. So it basically does not rely to any economic fundamental. So technical analysis is based on the premise that there are uh, analyzable market trends and waves that previous trends and waves can be used to predict the future trends and waves. Okay, so this is basically based on psychology or the pattern in the market parang history repeats itself okay so in addition to that when you speak of your technical analysis uh, this is basically a method of evaluating securities by analyzing the statistics generated by market activities such as past uh, prices and volume so technical analysts do not attempt to measure securities intrinsic values uh, but rather they use um, charts and other tools to identify a pattern that can suggest future activity okay so in addition to that when we speak of your technical analysis it's based on the following assumption so first is uh, the market discounts everything so stock price reflects everything that could ha happen in the company okay next is that um the price also moves in trends okay and then as we mentioned earlier history basically repeats itself okay so a trend when we speak of your trend this is a general direction in which a security or market is actually headed so it could be upward downward or perhaps sideward so in technical analysis the movement of highs and lows organize a trend so yan okay so this is an example of your trend okay so it could be high or low all right there you go so there so this is an example of a uh, trend of mcdonald's corporation there this is an example okay now let's proceed now to your currency convertible okay so until uh, this point we have individually assumed that the currencies of various countries are freely convertible into other currencies okay but due to government restrictions a number of currencies are not freely convertible into other currencies so a country's uh, currency is said to be freely convertible when the country's government 
allows both residents and non-residents to purchase unlimited amounts of a foreign currency with it. Okay, so there you go. And then we also have externally convertible. So um, a currency is said to be externally convertible when only non-residents may convert it into a foreign currency without limitations. But we also have non-convertible. So a currency is non-convertible when neither residents nor non-residents are allowed to convert it into foreign uh, currency there. Okay. So free convertibility is not universal. Many countries place some restrictions in their residents' ability to convert the domestic currency into a foreign currency. So restrictions can actually be minor. So when a resident of a country is restricted to a certain amount of money for foreign trips, but it is major, okay, if, uh, you know, major if they're restricting uh, domestic businesses ability to take foreign currency out of the country. Okay, but for subsidiaries like your FDIs, okay, your foreign domestic investments, they can convert their money in uh, foreign currencies. Okay, right. So why do governments limit um, convertibility of currency? So what is the answer for that? It is actually to prevent capital flight. What is capital flight? Capital flight is when residents and non-residents rush to convert their holdings of domestic currency into a foreign currency. Okay, so capital flight is most likely to occur when the value of the domestic currency is depreciating rapidly because of hyper inflation or when a country's economic prospects are shaky okay in other uh, respects so under such circumstances both residents and non-residents uh, tend to believe that their money is more likely to hold its value to convert uh, if it is converted into foreign currency and invested abroad so uh, the rise in import uh, prices resulting from currency depreciation will further lead to inflation so the possible remedy for currency okay non-convertibility is actually counter trade okay like um uh, barter like transactions uh you know goods or services to another goods or services so for example GE and Romanian government so GE actually won a contract amounting to 150 million and they agreed okay to receive Romanian goods that they can sell in international market yeah okay um, similarly, in Libya, okay, in 2003, they agreed to purchase $540 million, okay, in Indonesian goods in exchange of 50,000 barrels of crude oil a day. And so, okay, counter trade. All right, let's proceed to your transaction exposure so transaction exposure is the extent to which the income from individual transactions is affected by fluctuations in foreign exchange values so such exposure includes obligations for purchase or sale of goods and services at previously agreed prices and the borrowing or lending of funds in foreign currencies. So, for example, suppose you have agreed to purchase a machine, uh, okay, in US, in the US, amounting to one hundred fifty million, 
and the current exchange rate is that one dollar okay is equivalent to 50 pesos so that would be um five point or seven sorry sorry 7.5 billion pesos so if it is uh to be delivered and built in the succeeding year if the peso will depreciate okay to one dollar is equivalent to 55 pesos then you will be needing to pay at least okay more than 8 billion pesos okay there you go all right next is your translation exposure so translation exposure is the impact of currency exchange rate changes on the reported financial statements of a company so translation exposure is basically concerned with the present measure of um, past events so the resulting accounting uh, gains or losses are said to be unrealized okay uh, they are just paper gains and losses but they are still important so for example uh, ti's investment here in the philippines okay let's say if philippine peso continuously or continually depreciates against dollar then the firm's total value in dollars okay if consolidated in a balance sheet will have an effect in a firm's total uh, equity diba? okay all right next is your economic exposure so economic exposure is the extent to which a firm's future international earning power is affected by changes in exchange rate so um economic exposure is concerned with the long-run effect of changes in exchange rates on future prices sales and of course costs so this is distinct from transaction exposure which is concerned with the effect of change uh, exchange rate uh, changes on individual transactions so most of which are short-term affairs that will be uh, executed within few weeks or months so for example the rapid uh, rise of u.s dollars in exchange uh, market had an adverse effect on the pricing of u.s products okay so in reducing translation and transaction exposure okay um there would be forward exchange transactions or predetermined price prior uh, execution of or prior to the execution of transactions there should also be buying swaps or your so-called currency swaps okay and then there would be lead strategy uh, when you speak of your lead strategy it involves attempting to collect foreign exchange receivable payments from customers uh, early when a foreign currency is expected to depreciate and paying foreign exchange payables to suppliers before uh, they are due when currency is expected to appreciate so collect while currency is strong and pay while currency is strong so aside from your lead strategy we also have here your lag strategy so this basically involves collection of foreign currency receivables if the currency is expected to appreciate and delaying possible payables if the currency is expected to depreciate so delay collection until currency is strong or delay payment until currency is strong we call this your lag strategy this ends uh, my lecture for the second part of your foreign exchange market topic i'll see you then uh, on the next lecture